Welcome to The Dish, the show that uncovers the stories behind the world's most famous dishes. We are your hosts, Tomo and Megzi from foodfuntravel.com. Join us and expert guests for tasty facts, foody secrets and more. In part two of this Bulgarian cuisine double episode, Bulgaria's national pastry, Banitsa. Plus, we chat to Vasil from Bulgaria Wine Tours about some very traditional Bulgarian main courses. Also, a 100% Bulgarian dish from the Rodopi Mountains. Plus, Megzi's favorite Bulgarian drink. But should you be mixing it with milk? All right, welcome to our second episode on what to eat in Bulgaria. Yeah. Now we're getting into the good stuff. Not that the first episode wasn't good. So if you haven't had a listen to it, go back, check out the first episode where we're talking about all the delicious soups and salads and starters that they have in Bulgaria. But we like the deep and dirty, tasty food, the main courses. I liked a lot of stuff in the first episode. I think both episodes have great food. I love the soups and salads. That's why I really enjoy going to Bulgaria because I actually feel like I'm being healthy-ish when I'm there. Ish. Ish. But let's just be honest. There is some dirty, awesome food that you also got to have. And we're going to be talking about that in this episode. Yeah. So in that first episode, soups and salads, but also we introduced the fundamentals of Bulgarian flavor herbs and spices and other ingredients that really define the cuisine. So it is best to go back and listen to that episode first. That was last week. And then come back and listen to this one. You can listen to this one without listening to the other one, but that would, it makes so much more sense to listen to the other one first. Yeah, definitely. But if you have listened to the other one, let's get started. Now show notes for both episodes, which include at least 50 things to eat in Bulgaria. It's a mega post on all of the best food. You can find that at foodfuntravel.com slash Bulgaria podcast. All right. Now, we talked about in the previous episode, Shopska salad, which is a national dish of Bulgaria. But let's talk about the other national dish of Bulgaria, Banitsa. Banitsa is awesome. Of course. Yes. What it is, is like cheese pie, which is another word that they will call it. It is cheese pie. Cheese pie, cheese pastry. In its most traditional form, Benitza is a phyllo dough pastry filled with layers and layers and layers of that glorious phyllo dough. And between each layer, blended egg with the Bulgarian serene cheese. So mixed together and blended together and then just spread liberally between each layer. Mm. It's a very tasty baked pastry and all those lovely layers are just ripe for peeling apart. Oh, I love it. I love with phyllo pastry how you can just take each layer and eat. I don't know. I might be weird, but I like eating every individual layer of phyllo pastry until I make my way through the entire Benitza. Oh, it makes me so happy. Yep, you got the crispy top layers that are sort of to brown off a bit. You got the more doughy middle bits that are just soaked with eggy cheese wonder. And yeah, I have to say, one of the reasons why Benitsa is so good is because of that Bulgarian Serena cheese. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's got so much more flavor than some other white cheeses. I mean, Greek feta is also fantastic, but Serena is just so salty and wonderful. So if you have had anything in the Eastern Europe region, um, like it would be similar to your Burek if you've had that. But um, I don't know. It's just a little different the way that they make it. We actually did a cooking class. We were on a Viking river cruise. I think we're going to do an episode on that later on, about what we ate on our Viking cruise. Uh, Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, we did a a cooking class with a local family when we were in port. And yeah, it was just a very interesting, entertaining day of hanging out with this Bulgarian family while they showed us how they made their traditional benitza. Yeah, so this cooking class we did was near Vidin, which is northwest Bulgaria on the banks of the Danube River. And yeah, we went to this local home and the old ladies just showed us how they made the benitza and they plied us with plenty of alcohol whilst we were learning. Maybe that's why I enjoyed the cooking class yeah. so much. Educational tool. But yeah, the most popular form of benitza is definitely the one with the salty white cheese. But you can get lots of other different versions. They actually have other fillings which can include things like spinach or cabbage 
possibly meat, although the meat versions are more popular in other parts of the Balkans. I didn't see as much of the meat bonitsa. No, you get more like meat and potato burek rather than bonitsa, I think. Yeah. And so burek is, it's basically the same sort of dish. It's the same concept. And it's what you'll get in Turkey. It's what you'll get in Macedonia, the former Republic of Macedonia. Um, it's filo dough with the filling. But- Best burek. Bosnia and Herzegovina. Mm, the meat one in Bosnia Herzegovina was fantastic. Uh, yeah, so they're almost sort of the same dish. I'm sure Bulgarians will be like, they are not the same dish. They're totally different. They they are. But I the reason they're I'm, also different. The reason why I mentioned burek was so that if you have had burek, you would have like something that you can relate it to, that you would sort of know what we're talking about. I think typically from all the benitzas I've had, it's a little bit lighter. Then burek, burek can be quite dense. Yes. I think that's one of the main differences, just a bit lighter. Sometimes not quite as crispy, uh, just like a softer, lighter pastry. So, you know, but all of them are amazing. All of these filo hey, dough pastries are great. you can't go wrong with pastry and filling. It's exactly. like heaven. Uh, yeah, but also as well as those other savory fillings, they even do sweet versions. And at Christmas, you might get pumpkin in the banitza. Mm-hmm. You might get a savory pumpkin or a sweet pumpkin. Is it the Benitza that they hide the little baby Jesus in? Oh, that could be from Bulgaria. I've heard that story in places, other places as I well. I think they do. They hide like... Someone gets a baby Jesus figurette in uh, a figurine. Yeah. In their Benitza and breaks their teeth. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> That's your but luck. It's meant to bring like good luck for the next year or something. For your dentist. It brings good luck for your dentist. <laughs> the dentist is like, yeah, yeah, it's Christmas time again. Let's perpetuate this tradition. It's dental time. <laughs> Dental January. That's what they've got in Bulgaria. <laughs> so, yeah, we were at this cooking class and the old ladies showed us how to make the Benitza traditional style, how they did it. And they just throw each individual layer of filo dough straight in the pan and they sort of scrunch it up with their hands. It's very much a hands-in situation. I wouldn't situation. say they throw it in. I think that's definitely where the Bulgarian ladies will be like, there's a technique to it. There is a technique they to it. They swish it in. You well, reckon? they don't squish it. It's sort of like... Swish. They swish, swish it oh, in. they swish it in. With it's sort of... Finesse. It's sort of scrunched in an artistic way. Yeah, artistic scrunching is a good way to describe it. Yeah. And, you know, they've made up this eggy cheese mix and they just sort of sprinkle it over. Rustic style. Everything's very rustic when it's homemade. It's fantastic. And then, yeah, when it comes out the oven, it's all scrunchy and uneven. And that's mm. what makes it so brilliant is because it's so naturally uneven rather than factory made. Exactly. Love that. Now, banitza is supposedly most popular as a Bulgarian breakfast food served with a glass of ayran, which is a salty, watered-down yogurt My drink. My least favorite drink. In- <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind it. Yeah, it's a weird salty yogurt sort of thing. It's all right. But, of course, they eat banitza pretty much all day at any time. It's available in a bakery, and you can get this as a snack as well. But supposedly breakfast is like the number one choice. The smells walking around the streets of Bulgaria. Of so the many. bakeries will drive you insane. Yeah, so many bakeries. But also it's made as a special holiday dish. Any excuse to make a bonitsa is apparently the Bulgarian way. Um, it's also said that in times gone by, mothers would choose a wife based on her bonitsa skills. So if the son brings a woman back, she's like, bake me a bonitsa. If it's good enough, then maybe we will marry you. Is this the one... The place where, like, the wife makes the husband a dish, and if he says that it's good, like, she, she'll on purpose make it bad, and then he's got to sit there and say that it's good, because if he comments on the quality of her cooking saying that it's bad, she'll know that he's not a good husband. I think that was somewhere else. Ah, uh, okay. But yes, there was definitely somewhere we went where they were quite specific that she would made, she made bad food on, on purpose. purpose, and the husband potential husband was required to tell her that it was great in order for her to be like, all right, he'll be a good husband no matter what I do. Yeah. Now, this one, apparently, it's the mother of the son that is judging whether her bonitza skills are up to scratch oh, okay. and whether she's a good enough wife for her boy. Pressure's on. Pressure is on. I didn't on. have to cook anything for your mom. No. <laughs> That's a good thing. Otherwise, she- I wouldn't have got married. <laughs> <She's-> <laughs> <laughs> Could have been a problem. I, my mother's got low standards in terms of cooking. She's not much, <laughs> it might have been okay. She's not much of a cook. <laughs> she's not really into cooking. I'll be like, <laughs> I, I'll just be like, I can make a mean toasted sandwich. And your mom would be pesto like, Pesto pasta. Pes- I do make a good pesto pasta. There we go. I would have won you anyway. <laughs> Boil pasta, mix in pesto. You're a winner at that. Never <laughs> fails. As long as the 
Well, no, you make your own pesto. It's good. Mm-hmm. Fresh pesto is awesome. But you don't have to get married to enjoy a banitsa in Bulgaria because, of course, they are absolutely everywhere. It is so prolific. It has definitely become one of Bulgaria's official national dishes. And, of course, if we said similar layered filo dough dishes exist, most of the rest in every other country seem to be called burek. So that's the, the sort of difference. Banitsa is... It's just its own little version. Now, if you try and get burek in Bulgaria by mistake, you might end up with chushki burek, which is a very popular appetizer, which is bell pepper stuffed with serene cheese and deep fried in an egg coating. Oh, that was great. Very tasty, but very different from the filo dough pastry you might have been expecting if you went like, I've just come on the bus from Istanbul and I'm going to get a burek. Like, no, oh, it's no, a it's totally, totally, totally different dish. You won't be disappointed if you order it by accident, oh, no. but it is not what you're expecting. No, completely different, but an excellent appetizer that we very much enjoyed. All right. Now, the next dish I'm going to talk about might not be the most important, might not be even the best dish, but the word has some significance, which will become more clear as we go through the episode. This dish is called Satch. Do you remember the satch? I do, definitely, because satch is pretty much on every menu. There's quite a lot of satch around. Mm. Not everyone, not, not necessarily every menu, but it's like one of those, it's such an easy dish to make. Now, the word satch actually refers to the clay dish that the meal is served on, which is typically round and is normally sort of around 30 centimeters or about one foot in diameter. They're quite so it's big. A, it's, a, it's a big dish that will serve two people. Yeah. Um, nice and easy. All the ingredients that are cooked on the dish come out searingly hot because they are done basically as a massive sizzle plate. It's just this big clay dish that's thrown in the oven with everything on it and just cooked up and then brought out on the hot dish. Yeah. So it's always brought out on like a, a metal undercarriage that stops it from burning the hell out of the table. The ingredients thrown on the satch can be pretty much anything. Potatoes is common. Yeah, we had the potato and cheese one, which was really nice. We had a potato and cheese one with Bulgarian sausage and chicken. Oh, I forgot. I just remembered, yeah. I just remembered the cheese. Well, of course you remember the cheese. <laughs> I think almost all of them that we've seen on every menu say, and cheese. <laughs> the, and normally they're using yellow cheese rather than the Serene cheese. They, they seem to be using the Kashkaval cheese, yeah. which is the local yellow cheese that's throughout the Balkan region. Very popular. Sort of like a mild cheddar sort of style. Very not, less aged sort of cheese yeah so it's really that simple they throw ingredients on this pan but the satch is important because it's a dish that's used for quite a few different preparations different foods yeah so it's one of those things where the the name refers to the dish that it's prepared in rather than what the actual ingredients are yeah so if you just order a satch you might get anything on it yeah so do check what you're ordering and the satch yeah it can be used for quite a few different dishes and there's one very specific dish they don't always use a satch for this, but the version we had, they cooked it on a satch. And it's something that is 100% Bulgarian. This dish is not found anywhere else. And actually, even in Bulgaria, it's pretty hard to find. It is called Potatnik. 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 It sounds like a Sonic the Hedgehog bad guy. Yeah. Yeah, Robotnik. <laughs> <laughs> Except he's a potato bad guy. Oh. He comes out and he fires potatoes at Sonic. He's got a spud gun. And he's got, like, he holds a satch up in front of him to defend himself against <laughs> Sonic's like attack. Shield. Yeah, satch shield. <laughs> That'll work. Yep. So, yeah, as we said before, quite a lot of dishes from Bulgaria may appear sort of similar to other dishes from the Balkans, from Turkey, etc. But this one actually comes from the Rodopi Mountains, which are south of Plovdiv. And... Until very recently, uh, locals told us that you couldn't even really get this dish outside the mountains. You had to go on a day trip to the mountains, and then you could go eat this dish. But we've actually got a little clip from our Bulgarian wine tours guide, our friend Vasil, who took us out from Bulgarian wine tours. You can look them up on Google if you want to take a wine tour around that area. They actually have some tours in other parts of Bulgaria as well, oh, just yeah. in Plovdiv, because, of course, it's such a massive wine country that they've got lots of options for places to go. So let's have a listen to that clip as he introduces the Potatnik. So finding a prepared dish that is 100% Bulgarian and not prepared in the country surrounding Bulgaria, is there such a thing or is there not? It goes vice versa also for the other countries. Finding a 100% dish that is just Greek or Turkish and you can't find in Bulgaria or Serbia or Macedonia is also quite difficult. Here what you can what well, something that's quite traditional, for example, for these mountains that you see on the right, on the left, are called the Rodopi Mountains. Mm -hmm. 
And in the Rudopi Mountains, they have a dish called patatnik, which is something like a potato pancake. You can call it that way, I guess. Or a potato pie. We, or, we actually tried this a couple of days ago. Oh, yeah? Okay. It's, like a, it's like grated potato grated potatoes, mixed really. with butter. And cheese. And, and cheese, cheese and spearmint, yeah. Yeah, it's delicious. So you can either like make it on the pan like a pancake, or you can have it in the oven and have a crust. It'll be like, more like a pie. So this this I haven't seen, for example, in Greece or in Macedonia or in... No, but I it's agree. also, I But it's also very regional specific. You, you kind of mainly find it in the Rudopi Mountains. You don't find it in the north of Bulgaria, for example. Yeah. Uh, so there are some of those regional things that you can find in uh, in small places in Bulgaria, maybe not somewhere else. I, I'm sure it goes the same for Greece, Turkey, Serbia. There's some small regional dishes that are popular there and not in other places. Yeah. Yeah, the potato pie was very rich, um, but amazing. <laughs> it's one of those ones that once you've had a couple of bites, you just can't stop eating it, even though you know it's going to make you fat. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it's just, yeah, delicious. Um, but we're lucky we found it in Plovdiv. Mm. Some of the guides said you wouldn't even find it if you didn't go to the villages. Yeah. But obviously the restaurants have had some demand. People yeah, have come in yeah, and said, we want to eat this here. And yeah. Especially so now with selling the it. tourism growing in Plovdiv, I think some restaurants decided to introduce it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right, Patatnik. As the name suggests, patat, 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 suggests it's a potato pie. As we said, the one we had was cooked in the satch, although it could be cooked in any dish, depending on what locals have at the time. But the satch is one good way to do it. So get ready for some buttery indulgence. Oh, yeah. Do you remember how, like, you just dig into that and your whole taste buds just explode with, like, this is what I want to eat to fatten up for the winter. <laughs> feed it will me, certainly feed do that. me. Yep. Yeah, it's just the second you have your first bite, you go, oh. Oh, this is so dirty. Oh, God. Oh, my God. I, I, it was one of those dishes that we kept going, I can't eat anymore. I'm not going to eat anymore. And then the next thing you know, you're like, why am I still eating this? How did we finish the whole thing? Yeah. It was huge. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't the only dish we had. We ordered like something else on the side as well. <laughs> And Shopska salad or shepherd salad before that. Like, I regret nothing. Oh so good. But yeah, this dish came out. It's uh, normally made with grated potato, grated quite finely, laced with butter. And it, it was just because it was on the satch and it comes straight out of the oven. It had a crispy layer on the top. Yep. And, you know, it's much better than mashed potato. Forget mashed potato. It's like, imagine if you had a shepherd's pie and you just took the topping <sighs> off the shepherd's pie and no meat. Just that, but then add four times as much butter, mm-hmm. and importantly, to make it very much Bulgarian, and something we probably didn't even realize at the time, although we could see little dots in the dish, and you can even see it in the photo, didn't really think about what they were, but that's the Bulgarian spearmint that we mentioned in the last episode. Oh, yeah. That's an essential ingredient with this dish. If you don't put the Bulgarian spearmint in, you basically just eat it in mashed potato. Yeah. It's been baked. You've got to add that. That's what makes it very Bulgarian. But yeah, it originates from the Rudopi Mountains, and it's very close to the Greek border. But this is not a dish we've seen anywhere else. It's not a dish that you will find anywhere else. No. It is 100% Bulgarian, because it was invented in such a small community, in such a small area, that it, it wasn't really part of the whole Ottoman thing. They were probably living semi-autonomously, because they were so remote. So unlike the big towns of Bulgaria that were being affected by all the invaders coming in and out, these guys just went, yeah. Now, obviously, it's made from potato, so it can't have been around for more than a few hundred years because there were no potatoes in Europe. No, exactly. Since then, it became a thing there. I'm sure it was down probably to the fact that they didn't have loads of meat to eat because poorer communities wouldn't have done a couple of hundred years ago or whenever the dish was invented. I don't have the exact history. There's not a lot of history. All we know is that it comes from that area and no one else makes it. Yeah, and we didn't visit the village to go and ask people either. No, and even Next then, time. who knows whether anyone could really remember or whether anything's been written down. True. But who knows? Maybe next time we will. Maybe next time we'll go up there and eat some even dirtier potato pie. But if you want to find out where to eat it in Plovdiv, we did find one restaurant. Not everywhere serves it, but we found somewhere excellent that did. Very good, tasty version of it. Do check out our full article, foodfuntravel.com slash Bulgaria podcast, and look up the Britannic, and you will find out where to eat it. Next up, another Turkish-influenced dish that is definitely a staple of Bulgarian cuisine, can be found all over the country. The kavama and the kapama. Mm. Hmm. Kavama is a slow cooked stew with a choice of different meats, onions, and spices, normally with the chibritsa too, the summer savory that we mentioned in the first episode. That's such an important Bulgarian herb. 
and it's cooked inside the traditional gaivetchi clay pot. So it's another dish that is very specific to do with the type of cooking pot that's used. Uh, we've got another clip from Vasil, and he's going to tell us a little bit about his memories of kavama, and specifically kapama. It's similar to the kavama, but it's like a kapama, uh-huh, whereas yeah. all this, the different types. This is a, a different types of meat with cabbage and slowly cooked in a clay pot for hours. When in, in tradition we have that in the winter, yeah, because actually you know it's heavy, a heavy meal. My grandpa, uh, my dad, for example, makes it for Christmas. <laughs> traditionally so he put like uh, chicken pork beef sausages and he just starts starts the oven in the morning and until uh, dinner time slowly cooking so we have to come here for Christmas <laughs> yeah. so my uh, grandpa used to make these pots he was a potter uh, so we have so many and I kind of grew up being used to stuff cooked in the clay pots it's also easy you just throw things inside and just put it in the, in the oven you know what's key for cooking in a clay pot? You don't preheat the oven. You start the oven when you put in the clay pot with all the stuff, because in that way, the pot itself gets uh, quite evenly warmed up, and it kind of gets that, and, and, and it kind of cooks the food. It takes a bit more time, but it kind of cooks the food more evenly, in a way. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, when you cook in a clay pot, first of all, you don't add salt, because you can crack the clay pot. Uh-huh. And second, you uh, don't preheat the oven. You put the clay pot and then you start the oven. So, yeah, he's talking about his relatives who actually used to make and, that, yeah, they actually used to make the little pots. So they had loads of these little pots, little brown pots with a geometric color design around the outside. And they would put these stews inside. And, yeah, they are very pretty. Yeah, very cool. Very mm. specifically from Bulgaria, you sort of see this sort of pot used not just for this dish, but another dish we'll talk about shortly as well. Although the Gaiavecce pot might actually be of Turkish origin, we're not 100% sure on that, but the Bulgarians have added their own designs to this ceramic style. Uh, the Kavama and Kapama are supposed to be baked in this traditional pot in the oven. So it goes in the pot, then it goes in. But a lot of restaurants, we've sort of noticed they actually just cook up a massive batch of stew and then they just serve it in the pot for <laughs> speed. Yeah. Which is sort of lame. I mean, it still tastes good. Uh, what are you going to do? It's a restaurant. But you want to get it home cooked if you really want to have this done properly. As Vasil was describing in the clip, when they do it at home for Christmas and they make the kapama, which is the very special version of the kavama, it's like the, the super mega kavama. It's like another stage above. They do cook this in the oven properly. And of course, he explained that in the clip, how they do that. Now, this fancy kapama version, instead of just being one meat with some vegetables and stew, it's like everything. They throw in pork, chicken, lamb, rabbit, veal, sausage, like everything they've got, as much meats as possible. They throw them all in. They'll add ingredients like sauerkraut and dried plums, Mm -hmm. spices, and maybe red or white wine as well. So yeah, it's a a wine-based stew, but because the kapama is like a special holiday festival version of the kavama, it's extra special. It's not something we manage to eat because we're there in summer and we're probably not going back in winter. But (laughs) if you are there in winter, get invited to someone's Christmas party and maybe you'll get to try this extra special dish. Otherwise, you'll find kavama on a lot of restaurant menus, even if it's not made quite in the traditional way. You'll still get a good sense of the flavor. Now, let's talk about what... Yeah, it's probably one of my favorite cooked hot dishes. The gevechi. Or gevechi. Yes. Now, as I mentioned, the gevechi is the pot and this dish is actually just named after the pot. But it's so, what's in the pot that makes it so tasty. Inside the pot is some awesome, awesome wonderfulness. It's one of the most popular dishes in Bulgaria because I see it as a bit of a leftovers meal. They pretty much just be yeah. like, let's take a load of cheese, white cheese, serrano cheese, and whatever we have left at home, throw it in. Yep. Bake it in the oven for a bit. Done. That makes sense. It's totally a leftovers dish. Every single area seems to have a different version with different ingredients. And I've looked up so many recipes online for this to try and figure out what the actual foundations of the dish are. And even though people don't directly say it's a leftovers dish, it is just like every recipe is like, and then I throw in this, and then I throw in this. But the main thing is cheese and egg. Yeah. So a little bit of egg mixed in with the serrano cheese to make the base of the dish. 
and then they just mix in whatever other ingredients they have. So sometimes they do it in layers. Sometimes it's sort of mixed up together a bit, but in layers is sort of quite typical. So you've got like a cheesy layer, you've got like a vegetable layer, and then maybe on top, you've got some slices of meat thrown on. In fact, my favorite version that we had of this was the one that was described as Thracian style, yeah. which we had in Plovdiv. We've mentioned lots of Plovdiv stuff. We have actually been around quite a lot of, of Bulgaria. It's just Plovdiv happened to be one of the places where I feel like we ate more than anywhere else. We got an Airbnb and spent over a week hanging out in Plovdiv where, oh, we wait, we spent a close to a week hanging out in Veliko Tonovo yeah. as well. We spent a lot of time in Veliko. We spent a lot of time in Sofia. Yeah. We, we were visited a few other areas. I think we were just on a little bit more of a mission when we were in Plovdiv to just try as much as we could. Yeah, we ate a lot in Plovdiv. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, the Thracian style one. And if you remember, the Thracian Valley is the region where Plovdiv is and which was historically the realm of the Thracians before Bulgaria became a country after the Bulgars took over. What they use on top, they threw on Lukanka, which is a cured Bulgarian sausage. I think it's a beef pork mix, as I recall. I haven't got notes on that, but that's in the full article. And chili. So they had like a roasted chili on top. It was so good. Yeah, because I didn't know we were just like trying different stuff, and we go, oh, I think we had a list in Plovdiv of things we had to like that we'd heard that we of that we knew we had to try, and we're like, okay, it's time to try this one, and it was just a absolute game changer. Actually, I feel like restaurant old Plovdiv in Plovdiv, possibly one of the best meals we had in the whole of Bulgaria. I completely agree. I mean, we had quite a few fantastic meals. I just really loved everything there. So good. And this dish, probably my most favorite Bulgarian dish that we had the whole time. I mean, that white sereni cheese, it's so, so good. And when it's also baked and mixed with all these other things and the lakanka, just like meaty wonderfulness and a bit of chili to spice everything up. Mm -hmm. So, so good. So yeah, not a big story to Gaevich. It's all about the pot, which is the same pot that Bastille was talking about in the clip that his family used to make. But such an awesome food experience. Mm. Loved eating there. Loved that. And we've had the govetch in other places. And it's also, I believe, a popular dish in Turkey as well. Although I think it's made a little bit differently from this. It won't be using Bulgarian cheese, of course. But that one, that was an absolute winner. Now, the final dish I want to talk about that we're not going to talk about is moussaka or moussaka. Moussaka. Because there's huge amounts of controversy about who invented the moussaka. Well, we didn't actually realize until we hit Bulgaria that they had their own version of it. And then we were like, isn't this a Greek thing? And we just knew, thought of that because that's where we had it first. And so now well, we're Also, looking- I feel like it's famous around the world as being a Greek dish. It is, yeah. No one instantly goes, well, oh, moussaka, of- the Bulgarian dish. What do you think of when you think of Greece? You think yeah. of souvlaki. Greek salad. Greek salad. And moussaka. moussaka for sure. But as we discovered last time we were in Bulgaria, there's a little bit of controversy about where it actually, well, not even Bulgaria, just that whole sort of region. Although I have to say the controversy does seem to boil down to Bulgaria, Turkey, and Greece. Yeah. So it's not the whole Balkan region, but Bulgaria definitely has one of the, uh, like, no, it's ours. (laughs) Now, of course, this dish uses potato and that means it is not an old, old, old dish. Who knows, maybe they were making a stew with a different thing. Like Maybe they were baking moussaka before potatoes came to Europe. So that's another reason why it's like, surely we must actually be able to track down who invented this. Mm. Because it can't have been a real, like the whole moussaka dish was not a thing before the 1700s. No. Surely. But that was one of the, when we decided that we were going to do this podcast, that was one of the first dishes we wrote down that we wanted to do a deep dive into. Now, we've been to Greece and Turkey and Bulgaria, and we've spoken with different people, and literally the thing that we've got back from everyone is, oh, no, we invented it. <laughs> like, <laughs> all of them. Or like, uh, oh, yeah, it was invented in all of these places, no one knows. So it was one of the two. It was either like, no, we definitely invented it, or absolutely no one knows. So no one's willing to say, like, the other country, they invented it. They either say it's ours, or no one knows. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's not like, well, they invented it, but we do a better version. No. It's just like, no, it's, we did it. Of course we did. It's amazing. So who did it? I don't know. Now, the main thing with the Bulgarian version is they don't seem to use eggplant, whereas the Greek version definitely has layers of eggplant. I'm not sure on the Turkish one, actually. I can't remember if it had eggplant or not. 
But we are going to delve deep into the Musaka thing. The reason we haven't released the episode yet is because we are actually going to have to try and get some serious research and get some experts on it's this. It's a deep dive. Because traveling there was not enough to get enough information to decide where it's from. So Musaka, you got to eat it. It's very much a potatoey bake when you talk about the Bulgarian version, but it's great. Yeah. Love it. Now, finally, drinks. Now, there's a special drink that you particularly love. Yes. That we only discovered in Bulgaria, and apparently it's a Bulgaria thing. So, what is that? It is called mente, and it's a little bit tricky to sort of figure out what it is on like the menu and stuff. So sometimes it's just good to ask for it. But it was introduced to me once again by Vasil from Bulgaria Wine Tours. And he's like, you need to try this drink. And what it is, is it's, um, it's made with that mint. It's that mint flavoring that they have, but it's a drink, alcoholic drink form. And they just have it with ice and generally like Sprite. Or you could have it with tonic, but tonic is the worst. Actually, you can also have it with milk. Oh, yeah. For a very, like, crazy, fresh sort of taste. I'd give that a go. Yeah. We didn't try it. We had no, it with Sprite. but I think I'd give that a go. I love it with Sprite. And so I will just, when I'm in Bulgaria, I, it's just wine and mente, wine and mente. I love it. Yeah, mente is the go-to summer drink for sure. Really refreshing. Got that. It's just this beautiful mint drink that you have. And in, on a hot summer's day, it's, oh, it's lovely. Yeah, specifically, mente is a mint liqueur around 18 to 25% alcohol by volume that you can then mix with these different mixes like tonic, Sprite, or milk, though milk might be a little bit too crazy for our tastes. And of course, if you are getting yourself a drink there, you have to say a nazdrave. Cheers. Cheers. In Bulgarian. Nazdrave. <laughs> And there's probably going to be a lot of cheers going on. Cheers to good health. Cheers to safe travel. Cheers to new friends. And, of course, great wine. So do make sure you learn Nazdrave so that you can join in with everything. So, yeah, Mente, definitely one of our favorites. And I remember sitting out, and this is not a Plovdiv story. This is a Veliko Taranovo story, which was the old Bulgarian capital. Sofia is the current capital, but back in the 13th century, one of the original Bulgar capitals of the Bulgar the people, the people of Bulgar who became Bulgaria is Veliko Tarnovo, which is built on seven hills. I believe it's seven hills. I Maybe don't it's know. only it's a three lot hills. Of hills. There's a lot of hills. There's a lot of hills. But the main bank of Veliko Tarnovo is just this whole group of restaurants, bars, apartments all the way around. There's a meandering river at the bottom. So it's sort of this horseshoe shaped bank. And it goes way, 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 way up. So it's like a really steep... It's almost like a gorge or yeah, something. Yeah, it's almost but- like a gorge. And all the buildings are built up the side of the gorge. And there's so many balconies uh, in all the different bars and restaurants, terraces that you can go and sit out on and enjoy a drink. And then down in the middle of the valley on the other side of the horseshoe, the inner side of the horseshoe, because we're sitting on the outside of it, they've got this old monument with a guy on horseback, as you do. And yep. there's a museum on there. So yeah, you can sit there and just watch the sunset. And hang out. It's a great place. Probably one of my favorite, favorite places in Bulgaria. And I don't know anyone who's been there that doesn't agree. I think most no. people really love it. And we actually had lots of great food in Veliko Tarnovo. It just so happens that in these episodes, we've been talking mainly about Plovdiv stuff and other places. Uh, yeah. Well, that satch that you were speaking about with the potato and oh, yeah. the meat and stuff, that we had that in Veliko. That was super tasty. Our favorite Bulgarian wine we had was in Veliko. Yes, there is a restaurant called Haji Nikolai, which is an old coaching house. Bulgaria used to be full of coaching houses, and most of them got converted or destroyed over the years. But this one didn't, and I think it's been around since sort of the 17th, 18th century. Mm. Still there, and it's been turned into a restaurant now, but you've still got the massive archway that could fit a horse through. So you walk in, and then you can go and sit in the courtyard and enjoy some food. But their homemade Cabernet Sauvignon was... Outstanding. Definitely one of the best wines I've had in Bulgaria. But there are also some very specific Bulgarian wines that are made from grapes uh, that are much more Bulgarian than Cabernet, which is obviously not Bulgarian <laughs> yeah, at yeah, all. Yeah. So do check out Rubin and Mavrud. Mm-hmm. If you look at our article at foodfuntravel.com slash Bulgaria podcast, you will find a list in the drink section of some of the wines. We're not going to talk about wines today because we might do another episode just on wines because uh, the Bulgarian wine scene is pretty amazing. But Talking of mente, as we were just a little bit before, it's the mint spirit. It's about 25% alcohol, so it's more of a liqueur than a spirit. It's not super strong. We 
yeah, we really loved it as a summer drink. So it's something you, you can definitely get refreshed by on a hot day whilst sitting with a nice view in Veluco Turnover or wherever you happen to be. Uh, the other drink we'll just mention quickly once again is Rakia, which is a fruit brandy. It's made from all different types of fruit. Yeah. It's lethal. They drink it all the time. As Meg said in the last episode, I think it's, a, it's an appetizer drink. It's a digestive. It's a wake up in the morning drink. <laughs> it's, <just laughs> it's a everything. medicinal drink. Yeah, medicinal. Sure. <laughs> it has many, many uses. Unless you avoid all contact with locals, someone is going to make you drink rakia while yeah, you're there. Yeah, so just suck it up and go with it. But the thing Remember to ma- not to breathe in. Yeah. Don't t- breathe in. Don't breathe in while downing it. Yeah. You will be forced to shot it, I'm sure. The thing to mention for people listening to this who might have heard of raki, which is the Turkish drink, the Turkish spirit, this is not raki at all. Rakia is a fruit brandy. Raki is aniseed flavored. Totally different. And in Turkey, they drink raki. They mix it with water normally, and it goes cloudy. Whereas rakia is the Balkan spirit that they they pretty much just down it straight up, and they drink it all the time. So these are completely different things. So if you've had raki before and you didn't really like it, or you've had ouzo before and you didn't really like it, this is not the same thing. And it's not like brandy. If you're thinking of brandy like French brandy, where it's dark and rich, not like this. It's just just go and try. It's it. rocket fuel. You gotta give it a go. You just gotta give it a go. See if you like it. If you like it, you do. If you don't, you don't. But at least you gave it a go. All right, that's it for this episode. There is so much more amazing food from the Balkans, which is why we already made a double episode just from Bulgaria. But seriously, there's going to be more Greece content. There's going to be more Turkey content coming in the future. There's probably going to be some other countries as well. Maybe Montenegro. We lived there for a while. We got married there. We got married for the second time in Montenegro. That's a whole other story. Whole other story. Maybe that'll come out at some point. But yeah, we've done a lot of Balkans travel because we love that region. It's fantastic. And of course, we're going to be talking about moussaka in future episodes. We're going to be talking about Bulgarian yogurt versus Greek yogurt. Which came first? Which is the best? Everyone argues. Or is it Turkish yogurt? Everyone's arguing. Yep. It's a big battle. Will we put it to rest? Probably not. No. But we are going to discuss what the contention is and why you should be eating Bulgarian yogurt as well and the history around that. Of course, Serene cheese, which is the Bulgarian white brine cheese, and feta cheese. We've actually done an episode on this already. So you can head back to the feta cheese episode, season two, episode 17, or head to foodfuntravel.com slash feta podcast for some notes and the episode on that. That's already out. But that's it for this episode. So, you know, go rate and review us, yeah? Yep. Leave a five-star review if you dig what we do. That's so lame. (laughs) And again? (laughs) Leave us a five-star review if you uh, enjoyed listening to this show. That means we get higher up in the charts, and that means more people can find us and listen to us, and that means we can create more episodes. And one of the ways we can create more episodes is by having enough money to travel to them. So if you did want to become a supporter of this podcast, please feel free to sign up to become a patron. We have... Sign ups for as little as a dollar fifty a month, and there's actually a whole bunch of bonus episodes, little mini episodes in there that you can have a listen to that are not available to uh, listen to on this channel. And there'll be some more coming in future. And head to foodfuntravel.com/extras if you want to become a patron of the show. We're relatively new at doing the patron thing, so stuff will grow over time. So the main reason to join that is to just become a supporter for. Barely any money. A dollar fifty months, hardly anything. Buy us a drink. So we're not promising hundreds and hundreds of bonuses from day one because that's just not realistic when we've only got a few subscribers on the paid platform. But it just means that you are showing us that this is a project worth continuing. And we hope we're just going to get better at doing this as we go along. Season two, we hope, has already been more energetic and more fun and with better audio quality than season one. And we hope by the time we get to season three as well, it's just going to be going up and up and up and up. So help us with that. Support us at foodfuntravel.com slash extras, or just tell friends about the show and tell them to listen and subscribe and leave us a five-star review because that's also going to make a huge difference to us. All right. That's it for Bulgaria. Although it's not it for Bulgaria forever because it's never forever with no. Bulgaria. There will always be something else. We love Bulgaria a lot. All right, we'll see you on the next episode of The Dish. Thanks for listening to The Dish. 
Don't forget to subscribe and keep this podcast on the air by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you listen. Also, come join our foodie community on Facebook in the Food Worth Travelling For Facebook group. Catch you next time.